All right, I believe we have a quorum here. We'll go ahead and get started. I think I'm going to just introduce myself. I'm going to let the rest of the panel introduce themselves. We'll just pass it down the line. But there's no better way to kick off a discussion on crew endurance and fatigue <laughs> management. Wilson, the commander of Naval Surface Force Atlantic. Uh, Captain retired John Cordell, this is his brainchild. He's the one who called up a few months ago and said, uh, hey, I'm thinking about uh, contacting the SNA committee and having them let us have this discussion on crew endurance and to have a dialogue and an education about what we're doing out in the fleet. He said, sir, would you participate in this? I said, I I'm all in. Just tell me when to show up. And so he was going to be the moderator, and I was going to kind of do maybe a co-moderator type of framework. Uh, he could not be with us today, and so he let us know that last night, and so we are going to press on. But he comprised uh, a very august panel here uh, with a good friend of mine, Dr. Nita Shattuck, uh, from the Naval Postgraduate School, and she has done some phenomenal work. She and Chuck Good have a presentation that we're going to go into. Uh, here shortly. But before I give you some opening comments, like I said, let's just go down the, the uh, table here and have the panel members introduce themselves and then your role in this. So I'm Dr. Nita Shattuck. I teach at the Naval Postgraduate School in Operations Research Department and head up the Crew Endurance Program there. I'm Captain Chuck Good. I'm the Surface Warfare Chair at NPS, meaning I work for ComNav Surf Pack, but I work at NPS, so I have the greatest job in the Navy. <laughs> Captain Dave Soner, CEO of Monterey, former CEO of the Ramage. Good evening, Grant Greenwell. Uh, currently at Surfron 14 as the N7, just wrapped up a tour in the finest warship on the waterfront and top contender for 2018 Battle Lee USS Zephyr. It's hard to follow. Good evening, I'm Lieutenant Naomi Slusser, Chief Engineer on USS Halsey. Uh, good evening, Lieutenant Commander Joe Gordy. I'm the Chief Engineer of USS Iwo Jima. All right, so you see we have a very diverse panel here to talk about crew endurance. Uh, I want to start with a short exercise. If you are a surface warfare officer or you've served on surface ships or submarines, I would ask you to please stand. That includes the Greybeards as well, obviously. Panel members can be excused from standing. No. All right. <laughs> now. So, so would you include aircraft carriers and surface? Hey, that's just a big surface ship. You could stand. <laughs> Matter of fact, we, we say when an, when an aviator becomes proficient, we <clears throat> make him a surface warfare officer and give him command of, here, here. of an aircraft carrier. <laughs> now, if you're a surface warfare officer and you're standing or you've served on ships, uh, remain standing if you've ever stood a mid-watch. That's good. N nobody was on uh, day watches only. It it's good to see that. <laughs> now, remain standing if at some time during your time in the Navy standing that watch you felt tired or less than 100% alert or maybe even at times even took a micro nap. Everybody's still standing. So everybody did that. Now you can have a seat. And then I'll ask you, when you felt that way and you're on watch, do you think that was a good thing? I think we all agree that it was not. And but it wasn't good then, it's not good now. When we're talking about the type, the type of great power competition that we're embarking on, th there's no time for on a great team to be part of this competition for anybody to be on the playing field and, and not be back. fully alert and ready to go at all times. I want to quickly take a three-bearing fix on crew endurance and fatigue management, and then 
I will turn it over to Dr. Shattuck for her presentation with, uh, with Chuck. Uh, the first bearing, the first line of bearing, I would say, it's leadership. And this is simply about taking care of your people. I'm sure everybody can remember when you were a junior officer and you felt the way that you just described and you were tired, because I remember it. And I can remember saying to myself, when I have the opportunity to change this and make a difference, that's what I'm going to do. I don't want my people tired on watch. So if you've been up all night standing watch, I'm not going to require you to come to officer's call, for example, when you should uh, go hit your pit or get in your tree, as we should say sometimes. I want you to be well rested. And as a commanding officer, when I lay my head on the pillow at night, I want to make sure uh, that the man or the woman that I've qualified to be in charge of this billion dollar vessel uh, is alert so, so I can rest easy. That can't happen if they're tired. And so this is simply about taking care of your people. That's the first line of bearing. You don't want your people to be tired. You don't want your people to be hangry. You don't want your people uh, to be struggling through their day to do their job and not be alert. Uh, second line of bearing there's a science to this, and that's why Dr. Shattuck is here. And for the longest time, we've missed this in the surface warfare community. You know, a lot of us have stood five and dimes. He said, well, hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting plenty of sleep, uh, five and dimes, you know, if they leave me alone. Uh, it, your body clock doesn't work that way. And so there's a science to this. And we are all walking computers. And if the computer's clock gets thrown off and doesn't get a chance to reboot, it's no different than your computer that's on your desktop or your laptop. The files will become corrupted. And you will not be able to operate at peak proficiency. And so you've, you've heard this even when you were going to school, you know, well rested is well tested. Now, if, if you never study and you just think you're going to sleep all night and then go take the exam, that, that's, that's not going to work either. And I'll talk about that at the end. But there's a science to this. And so that's what the presentation's about. And then the, the third line of bearing to get the fix is th there's a practicality that has to be in place here. So you can institute a circadian rhythm on board your ship or within your organization. Uh, and you can do everything that's in the brief. And you, you can set that body clock the way it should be. But if you don't adjust the ship's schedule to facilitate it, it doesn't work either. And so, yeah, institute circadian rhythm on your ship. Uh, that's a culture of compliance. Yeah, go do that. Uh, but the final piece that you can't miss is, is the culture of excellence, and that's reorganize the ship's routine to facilitate uh, carrying out the circadian rhythm. You, you can't have all the bells and whistles going off the way they used to uh, when you go to this. Those are your three lines of bearing to get at the fix of this crew endurance. And with that, Nita, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, sir. So thank you all, first of all, for inviting me to be a part of this distinguished panel. I need to acknowledge four 06s um, who have gotten me to this point. The first one was Captain Bob Firehammer. I don't know if any of you knew uh, Bob. He was uh, tragically killed in a, a bike accident right after his retirement, but he was the uh, CEO of NAVMAC. Uh, he was also a, a SWO, and uh, he was passionate about this. We worked on it together. And then this, the next 06 that, that I worked with was Captain John Cordell, and he was just, uh, is so passionate about this, shares that same passion. It's just really amazing 
uh, to have had both of them, to be able to work with both of them. The third 06 in my life that, that has really gotten me here is my husband, who's an Army 06, retired Army 06, but he has pushed me along, helping me uh, in every step of the way to, to work for the sailors, to work for, uh, for, for this crew endurance project. And lastly, uh, Captain Chuck Good, who's going to follow me here. So I just want to acknowledge those. And then there's a whole slew of O3s that have uh, been students of mine out at the Naval Postgraduate School. And they have just been phenomenal team members with this. So um, what I'm going to do is attempt to uh, sque squeeze two decades of findings into the next five minutes. So you guys bear with me. Um, so first of all, a little cartoon. So we see here this. Uh, the, the, the door that leads to the bridge, the sleep deprivation chamber. And in fact, when I first started 20 years ago, when I first started uh, teaching at the Naval Postgraduate School, the SWOs there were telling me about uh, the sleep patterns they were on. And I really thought they were pulling my leg. But in fact, when, when I started riding ships, I realized that in fact, I was, in fact, in a real live laboratory. The things that you were doing to yourselves were things that I could not get permission to do from a civilian uh, human use committee. They would not give me permission to do it, but you were doing it to yourselves. So, uh, so thank you for that, but uh, uh, hopefully we can break you of that too. So over the past 20 years, these are some of the ships that we've collected data on. This isn't, isn't all of them by any means. But I just point this out to you to show you that my team has collected lots of data on ships. And what I will point out is that with a single exception, no one is averaging eight hours of sleep. That's the red line is eight hours. The single exception is LCS2 during rough water trials. You can probably figure out why everybody was getting lots of sleep. I was on the ship and it happened to me too. Um, so let's, so, but this doesn't tell the whole story. There's two other things you know about to tell the story. So we're not getting a lot of sleep, but the two things you need to know about are light and circadian rhythms. So when I look at light, what, we, what I'm just going to go through real quickly with you is to tell you about the story of, of, of how light is so important in our circadian rhythm. Before we had um, the, the incandescent light bulbs around and other lights now that we have, modern lighting, um, we had about a 12-hour sleep opportunity at night. I call this pre-Edison. But then post-Edison, it went down. We've got all these lights available. We can do all this stuff, stay awake. And our sleep opportunity has shrunk considerably. That's with artificial light. And then, in fact, what you do, I don't know how many of you did this last night, you take your devices to bed with you, and you further sleep deprive yourself. So you have, again, reduce that sleep opportunity to maybe six and a half hours of sleep. And when you do night shift work, that sleep opportunity is again uh, messed up. So it's uh, a, a big issue there. Often this, the sleep uh, for night shift workers is, or on the ships at least, is split sleep occurring in two segments. OK, that's the light piece. The other piece is the circadian rhythm. So when you look at a circadian rhythm, Everybody's got it. It is in every cell of the human body. Um, and when you look at this, this is a circadian rhythm of alertness. You can see that there's two, two dips. Uh, a couple of hours ago, you were uh, entering your circa first circadian nadir right after lunch. Uh, and then you have this uh, uh, very big uh, dip in the middle of the night. And that was your typical sleep window. So, uh, but what we know is that um, as long as you're working days, sleeping nights, that's good. But what we do is we do things to disrupt that, that nice circadian rhythm. And two of them are shift work and jet lag. We call it shift lag and jet lag, two common circadian disruptors. So I don't know if you guys can see these little clocks running around the, the, the um, uh, various organs of the body, but they're all nicely synchronized. This is when you sleep at the same time each day. It allows your body to stay in sync. However, now look at the little clocks. I know it's kind of hard to see back there, but they're all out of sync because it, it takes about a, a day per hour for your body systems to adjust. 
all this, the cells in your body, they all have to adjust. So that's when you feel really bad when, you, when you're doing jet lag or have, have, have to work a different shift. So this is my one slide that basically kind of summarizes uh, what we've learned over the past 20 years or so. I, I divide them up into short-term effects, intermediate effects, and long-term effects of poor sleep. Short-term, we see uh, performance changes. We see procedural errors, slower reaction times, vigilance uh, issues, inconsistent logic. Your short-term memory is degraded. Your mood is worse, uh, increased risk of injury, elevated cortisol levels, intermediate, like a, a week to months. We see loss of motivation and morale, impaired judgment, weight gain, reduced libido, slower rate of wound healing, uh, reduced immunity, takes longer to train people uh, when they're sleep deprived, and increased mishap rates. And long term, we have a, a term uh, we call a syndrome called circadian scarring. If you abuse this circadian system and your sleep habits, to the point that you no longer are able to sleep normally. That's what we call circadian scarring. Um, we also see metabolic disorders, diabetes, chronic disease, obesity, and heart disease, and this whole inability to recruit and retain personnel. So, and also increased depression and suicidal ideation. So all bad things. All right, I have to show you one slide with some results. Uh, I told you I've collected lots of data. This is uh, data from uh, the, uh, the USS Nimitz. This is the reactor department. Um, we had crew members who we studied two on two schedules, the same crew members. Uh, you can see uh, in the top uh, graph uh, that the crew members, when they were working a five and dime schedule, the reactor department. And, and then you see the same people when they're on a 3-9 watch bill, a circadian-based watch bill. What we see is that they're approximately 30% faster when they're on the 3-9. Uh, and the bottom slide actually shows us errors. So probably more important, they're making 40 to 50% fewer errors when they're on the circadian-based watch bill. So a real win-win. So NPS is continuing to do lots of work with, uh, with um, trying to help sailors. Um, some of the things that we're doing is we're trying to uh, to work with light, giving sailors different ways of getting this uh, light so that we can adjust their circadian rhythms. We also have little warfighter sleep kits. I think you may have them on your, on your chairs. And we have a, a handbook that we've developed. We also have uh, a, a website uh, that we have available for you to go. Um, the, the new one is coming out in the 1st of March. But we welcome your, uh, your inquiries if there's any way we can help. We're standing by. Thanks, Nita. So what you've got is the science of sleep, and I'm not going to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the policy uh, coming out of surf War. I will apologize. Those in uniform 06 and below may have seen some variation of these slides. Uh, Professor Shattuck and I have been traveling. We've hit all the fleet concentration areas with our circadian road show. We've been to SWAS, briefed every uh, shipboard commander's course for the past uh, 14 months. So. Uh, but as a leveling brief, we'll just go through a few things. The first thing I'd like to do is do a little bit of myth busting. Now, we SWOs tend to be a cynical lot. I know that's a shocking statement, but uh, you know, the cynical SWO. The cynical SWO would say, you know, come on, who are you trying to con here? This is all just a CYA because of the incidents that happened in 2017, and, and don't try and con me. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. So this story starts in May of 2013 when uh, Vice Admiral Copeman, then Commander Naval Surface Forces, sent out a message to the force saying, hey, you know, uh, there's this body of research that Professor Shattuck and, and some others have been doing, and uh, it seems to indicate that this could be uh, a useful technique. Uh, ships are authorized to experiment with these circadian watch standing techniques. So that was kind of a first step. You may do this if you want to. Um, I flew out and took command of USS Princeton several months after that message came out. I was unaware of the message. I was unaware of any of this. I stepped on board the ship, started taking my turnover briefs, and I said, senior watch officer, get me, bring me the watch bill. What kind of watch rotation we're on? Five and dimes? I've always been a five and dime guy. We're five and dimes, right? Oh, no, sir, we're doing the circadian thing. We're on these fixed watch scales. I'm like, 
what kind of hipster weirdo, what did a bunch of J.O.s got a hold of the old man in a moment of weakness and conned him into some you know, weird thing, and I'm like, all right, I'll fix your wagon on the way back uh, from the Gulf. Boy, two weeks of watching this in action, and I became a believer. I saw a crew that was rested, alert on watch, were content with their, their personal routines and how they could weave their own personal routine into their watch and work schedules. And I saw happy people smiling. It kind of freaked me out, you know, three quarters of the way through deployment, people got smiles on their face in the POA, like, you know, what's going on here? The stuff works if you put the effort into it. It's not perfect, it's not a panacea for all the ills that, uh, that we're having to deal with, but it works if you put the effort into it. So let's continue the story. So April of 2016, now Vice Admiral Roden is Commander of Naval Surface Forces, and Admiral Wade is, is the cause, and, and Admiral Ross is the cause on, on the East Coast. April 2016, another message go, comes out with a stronger endorsement of the circadian watch standing. Instead of a may, it's a, you know, you should do this. You don't have to, but you really should do this. All that precedes the events of 2017. So this train had left the station long before these operational mishaps. This is not an e-jerk response. It is not a CYA. Now let's move up to the events of 2017, which culminated in November 2017 with uh, Surfpack and Surfland issuing jointly Instruction 3120.2, the Comprehensive Fatigue and Endurance Management Policy. Admiral Brown spoke about it. Admiral Wilson spoke about it. Compliance-based regime versus an excellence-based regime. A compliance-based comprehensive fatigue and endurance management policy would have been prescriptive, lengthy, administrative. The Coast Guard equivalent of this policy is 40 some odd pages. Ours is two and a half pages. It's a two and a half page document. There's some guidance, there's some precepts, and there's explicit latitude given to the commanding officers to tailor those precepts to suit their specific circumstances, their manning, what phase of the OFRP cycle they happen to be in, and what their operational employment is. That's an excellence-based instruction. And now I'll go through what is contained in that excellence-based instruction. So there's two main precepts that we're talking about. The first is adopting a watch scheme that is inherently coupled to the human circadian rhythm that Professor Shattuck just briefed us on. Okay. The key here is different from almost every traditional watch standing scheme that most of us grew up under, like five and dime, standard Navy dog. You stand the same watches every day. You don't do a rotating scheme. So your day, your watch scheme has to add up to 24 hours because that's the circadian rhythm. Okay. When you're standing the same watch every day, your body can resynchronize those little clocks that get asynchronous when you, when you establish yourself on a new watch routine, have time to get synchronized again. So you stand that, if you're the mid-watch guy or gal, you're going to be on mids for three to four weeks. But you're going to get sleep periods that are going to be tailored to that mid, and you're going to be allowed to synchronize. When you're on a five and dime, recalling what Professor Shattuck just briefed us on about shift lag and jet lag, when you're on five and dimes, you are doing the same thing to your body as a flight from the West Coast to Japan, and you're doing that to yourself every day. That's how much disruption to your, your internal systems is occurring, okay? You stand fixed watches that, are, that add up to 24. That's, that's the threshold for compliance, and excellence builds on that, and, 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 and we'll get into tailoring the shipboard routine to support that. This crew endurance handbook that Professor Shattuck's team has put out at the Naval Postgraduate School, the Navy's premier research university, um, contains some recommendations. They are not prescriptive. They're simply recommendations. They've been modeled. Data has been collected on them. We know they work, and they conform with the policy. If you're in two sections, we've got some options for you. If you're in three sections, we've got some circadian options for you. If you're in four sections, we've got some circadian options. There's no intent to prescribe to COs how many watch sections they have to be in. Simply execute a circadian version of however many sections you're in, okay? We had no sooner put this out than a CO emailed us and said, hey, what do you got for five sections? I'm like, geez, what, did you win the manpower lottery or something? But all right, we'll work on that. We can come up with something. Um, 
All right, the second thing, you adopt the watch scheme, but then you have to adopt a shipboard routine that fundamentally supports and reinforces that watch schedule. You have to establish protected and predictable sleep times. Now, that's a controversial thing. A lot of people are worried that we're establishing some kind of union rules where, oh, I've protected sleep, you know, I can't go to flight quarters at that time. No, we will always flex to operational requirements. When we say protected, who are we protecting people from? The dam XO <laughs> and the plan of the day. We do a lot of damage to ourselves. So you got people coming off the mid at 0400. Do you have to, at 0600, pipe a bosun's call into the 1MC, which if you held the decibel meter up at any speaker would probably exceed the threshold for single hearing protection. Do we have to do that at 0600? Could we do it at 0800? Do we have to hold the ops intel brief at 1900? Or could we hold it at 1530 before dinner? We can set ourselves up for success. We're not always going to be able to give people their full sleep periods, but we can structure our shipboard routines and employ best practices. It requires a lot of coordination. It requires a lot of buy-in up and down the chain of command on board a ship. But you can reinforce that watch rotation with a shipboard routine that works. This is an example. The handbooks that you should have all gotten when you came in here have many other examples, but that's how you kind of put it together. And it works. And that's all I have, Admiral. Thank you. No, that's very good. So you can see with, uh, with friends like us, who needs enemies, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, when you talk about great power competition, any competition, uh, the coach will tell you right up front, uh, one of the first things that we want to do is not beat ourselves. This, if we don't get this right, we are literally beating ourselves. And not, not only that, affecting the health of our crew. Another great power competition, the NFC Conference Championship and the AFC Conference Championship that's gonna happen this weekend. I will guarantee you that Coach Belichick will have his Patriots in Kansas City well before 24 hours before game time for this very reason, because he, he will not put his players on the field without them being at peak performance, with all those little organs spinning at various different rates. It's not going to happen. They're going to get there well in advance, get acclimated, their body clocks, and the Rams will do the same thing when they go to New Orleans. Why? It's a great competition for them and they want to win. Mm -hmm. We're no different. And the stakes are even higher for us in our business. So how much more should we be paying attention to this? And so this is a great education. Um, let me ask a question of, of one of the panel members, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over uh, to, some, uh, to the audience here, and you can ask the next question. And I've got a couple more to keep it flowing. But we won't, uh, we won't keep doing this until we all fall asleep. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll cut it off at some point. But I want to uh, address this to Dave Stoner, the commanding officer of USS Monterey, the, the first ship uh, in our force to deploy as a surge deployer during the OFRP construct. Dave, can you tell us? how you implemented this, and the challenges and best practices associated with it. Thank you, Admiral. So, uh, so I had a lot of challenges in the 40-something uh, days that I had between uh, the time that, uh, you know, JJ called me, and if you're an East Coast sailor, you know who JJ is. Uh, the fleet scheduler says, hey, you might want to start thinking about getting ready for deployment, uh, and then we left on the day that we were told to leave. Uh, so among those challenges was just uh, being a new CO on board, understanding uh, the crew and the teams and getting everybody organized. And so when the message came out in November uh, that Circadian was a requirement, uh, I got a lot of pushback from the crew that said, was, was uh, fatigue really an issue in these collisions, right? Because we deployed as a direct result of the two collisions, right? There was a, a gap in BMD ship coverage uh, and we went out to cover that gap. 
and so the answer is really this is more than about sleep and fatigue. There is nothing that we will do that will ever remove fatigue <coughs> from the equation, right? It is a fact of what we do. It is a fact of the life that uh, there are times when we will operate when we're fatigued. Uh, but it's about establishing the normal. So for me, it was more about human factors and really how do you take care of the crew and communicate to the crew that their sleep is important. So I, I, you know, we were very overt in that this is not just about sleep. This is about we're making sure that you are always ready to go, right? So for the Chengs in the room, we don't empty our service tanks, uh, right? We keep them full so that if we need to go fast right away, we've got enough fuel to do that. Right, same thing in the radar, right? We keep the radar running and enhanced. So if we've got to go fast and we've got to do it for a long period of time, we've got some amount to drift in there. Uh, and so communicating to the crew that this is about keeping a balance in the sailors as part of the machine that we do, right? So I also used uh, the, the rotation. We were three uh, and nine because uh, of a recent deployment. I had enough qualified watches to do that. That was a luxury for me at the start. Uh, but we also in, in, rolled into this teamwork. Uh, so we, we kept the teams at the same sections, right? So this was the EAO, the CSAO, Air, Surface, CSC, the OOD, the TAO. The TAOs couldn't go five section. That was a big consternation. I had plenty of TAOs to do that, but I wanted to rotate everybody as a team. So a whole month, that team together, on the same hour, on the same rotation, got us a really good return uh, on that investment. So it was far more than just the sleep. Uh, we had to change information and workflows. Uh, I just didn't do ops intel briefs. I thought they were a waste of time, right? You go to the mess decks to bring people who don't want to be there to hear things that I already knew. So why are we doing that, right? So we just gathered in CIC. It was more important for me to visit each watch team uh, while they were on watch at some point during the day than to get them all into the mess decks uh, to hear things that I already knew. So we just fundamentally changed a lot of the things that we did. And so how you implement this is really to develop that toughness and resiliency that we talk about a lot. You know, and the formula for that, you know, fitness times belonging times identity squared. Back in the old days, right, it, you know, back to that first cartoon, if you sleep deprived yourself, you belong to the team. Right, that was your that was your in card. Like if I, you know, if I could stay up for 36 hours, then I was a member of the team. I belonged, and that was your toughness. Right, so we we've got to reorient that to keep the human body running as part of equipment. Right, that we would anything else on board, and so that was the approach that we took. Uh, I've got several members of my crew here. You can go ask them uh, if they have the same view on my implementation as I did. I think it paid big dividends. Uh, you know, and then in the late stretches of our deployment. Uh, we were still at peak performance and doing great things, uh, whatever we were asked to do. No, that's great. And, and I love how you use that toughness equation. Uh, and it, it's very relevant because, you know, there used to be that culture that, uh, you know, we wore it as a badge of honor, as a SWO, of how tired we were. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but you said, okay, that's our identity, that identity squared. But Nita, you just showed us that you're breaking down the body by doing that. And, and that's the fitness part yes, of that equation. So as that starts to go to zero, your toughness goes to zero and your ship can't fight and your crew can't fight. And so uh, I like that. All right, so for the audience, uh, question, and, and you have to be awake when you ask this. <laughs> Sinclair Harris. Uh, Sinclair Harris. So um, what you said makes total sense, math looks perfectly logical and all that. I can see how this works for the crew for the most part. Department is probably tougher. How does it work for the commanding officer? Every standing order I think I've ever read has about a zillion times for you as an officer at deck or CIC watch officer or chief engineer to call the captain, including if you're just bored, call the captain. So how did you implement it for the captain? So, uh, so I'll answer quickly, then I'll pass it over to, uh, to a, a much younger uh, CEO. Uh, it's called XO, right? So uh, there were times when I really had to strategically use the XO, and we talked about this. So Suez uh, Transit is a great example, right? That is a marathon event. Uh, so we went to, you know, to the Anchorage area early. Uh, I, I saw us get in there, and then I left the XO up there you know, for a period. I went down and slept literally until the pilot 
was making his way out. Uh, then I came up, and as soon as we got into the Suez and making our transit, Exo went down, and he went to sleep, right? Because we didn't know what was going to come up later on. And when you go south, then you get into this, you know, this long overtaking situation. And so we continued to kind of rotate purposefully uh, to make sure that somebody had recently gotten some sleep. Uh, we did that on a number of uh, uh, escort transits we had to do through Hormuz and, and the BAM. Uh, we would plan our workup time getting to that event of when EXO and I were going to get some rest and when, how we were going to split the difference. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, sir. Uh, good evening, Admiral. Thank you for the question, sir. So uh, on a PC, similarly, you uh, go ahead and try and divest yourself of those uh, reports, if you can, to the EXO uh, if you're faced with a situation that uh, you're going to be up for 24 or 48 hours or longer. Um, you know, two instances in Zephyr that we've had uh, recently is doing a uh, Panama Canal transit uh, going over to East Pack. That's a fairly lengthy transit for a PC. Uh, and there's times that you have to go ahead and say, hey, I'm going to go down to the cabin for four hours, EXO, you take it. Um, uh, also, when you go ahead and you recover smugglers, uh, you're up for, I mean, Cam Ingram can uh, attest to it as well, uh, you're up for at least 48 hours with uh, the detainee processing of those gentlemen, and there's times that uh, you just have to tell your entire team, hey, make the really important reports, which are the standing order reports, to the XO, and we'll let the XO uh, go ahead and make those reports to me if he or she feels necessary. Uh, but again, you know, like Captain Stoner was alluding to, it goes into a culture of make sure that you're reinforcing the training and the important things first. See, I like all of that and this is why you have an XO for a reason and it also speaks to delegation uh, matter of fact I've got the CEO of SWAS sitting right over here Scott Robertson and he will tell you uh, so in this particular case not only is the commanding officer making sure that he gets rest so he's able to command and his body's at peak performance but he's also training his XO He's letting his XO legitimately feel what it looks like, what it feels like to look back and there's no safety net because you have it. The captain's asleep and he has delegated this to you. So you've got to rise to the challenge. And we want you doing that as an executive officer and not doing it for the first time as a captain. So this is win-win and this is another reason why we have to do it. Chuck. Admiral, just a quick point of information, Admiral Harris, thank you. Uh, I believe John Cordell, of whom we spoke earlier, is going to have an article in the next print issue of Proceedings that will speak to this exact point, discussing mu much of the same as, as we've heard. And it, I've, I've seen a preview, and it's a good article. All right, we've got a question here. But, you know, I mean, as I think of, of this particular situation, I mean, the Suez and the Panama Canal, those are different situations, and I think there are going to be times when this does, those particular instances don't sound like circadian rhythm. They sound like unique instances where the captain and the XO have to jumble their particular sleep patterns. Not that we get into the actual circadian rhythms there, it's just we just need to make sure we get enough sleep. So I, I don't know, Dr. Shattuck, if you could speak to that a little bit. So. So uh, if you're working, I mean, if you, if you do split your time, I mean, they do this all the time in the Air Force where they have two pilots who, who fly 40-hour missions. You can, actually, you can actually do that effectively and, and stay, uh, if, you, if you're attentive to your sleep and you abide by that. So, but otherwise, you know, you're, you're right. You're, you, there's no substitute for sleep. But I think this, this addresses it for many of the times. I think if you can, in fact, there will be times that you'll both have to be up. But there's 24 hours in the day. We're not suggesting that people get more than eight hours of sleep per night, or even seven. You know, a good seven is, is adequate for, for many people. So I think, I think they can do that. I think they can effectively share those, those responsibilities. It, so, so again, I would say circadian keeps the, your service tanks full. Right, and so that those adjustments that you have to make, you're starting from a full service tank, and so uh, you, you know you're able to do that. So I, you know, my personal battle rhythm was circadian. I would take the night orders around at a certain time. I would do certain things, and then I would go down. I would try to get up at the same time so that uh, you know we're working that in so that when the surge comes, you're more prepared for the surge. Sort of, you 
So, so we didn't uh, change the standing orders, but there were definitely times when I just called the bridge and said, just make all reports to the XO. You know, you, I would have a conversation with him. Uh, hey, I'm going to give you these reports until this time, and then I would just call the bridge uh, and call the TAO and say, just call the XO until you know X hour, and then I'm checking, you know, checking off station. And, and not standing orders, but just the night orders. So nothing that's you know over an extended period Correct. of time, but just for that night or for a couple nights, you can just put that into the, the night orders. Um, sometimes the situation is different as it relates to a particular department on a ship. So I wanna ask uh, Naomi down here to, as the chief engineer of the hailer, uh, Halsey, um, tell us how you work this in the engineering department and, and what kind of challenges that you had. Thank you for your question, Admiral. I would bin our, our challenges in a kind of two separate groups. So one was at the department head level, as Admiral Sinclair referenced earlier, and then for my personnel, and I'll speak to the latter first. So for uh, engineering personnel, there were challenges uh, initially with scheduling uh, regular maintenance, large repairs, and training. And what we ultimately decided to do was uh, I pulled key people off of the watch bill. So my MPA came off of the watch bill, Topsnet came off of the watch bill, and eventually, uh, towards the end of deployment, I was able to pull my ETT members off of the watch bill as well so that we could support training, repairs, and routine maintenance kind of throughout the day. And I think this kind of had the unintended uh, consequence, or I would say benefit, rather, of uh, creating an environment where my more junior sailors, uh, and in particular my more junior officers, were able to kind of confidently and competently lead in places where they usually didn't because I, I was forced to delegate many things that I, I wouldn't necessarily have delegated. Uh, and we were also given the benefit with all of those people off of the watch bill of having senior supervision throughout the day. Um, for me, as a department head, I would say that that delegation piece was, was really key. And then also uh, prior planning and constant communication with my captain and XO, I think made them probably more comfortable than they might have been uh, having more junior people run the department. And so we had maintenance intentions that would go up to the captain along with my night order so that he was clear on, on what would happen all through the night, even when I was on watch or when I needed to be asleep, and uh, we would make sure we established his level of comfort. And uh, in addition, I made sure to check in with the captain and XO when I was awake, and, and on their end, they, they didn't wake me up or try to contact me for things that weren't actually an emergency. No, that's good. And what I like about this is Remember the comments that, that Nita made about if, if you allow your body clock to be thrown off uh, by not being in a circadian rhythm, then the training that you're doing doesn't take, okay? Because you're not alert, so you're not grasping it. And, and if you're not training, then you're not building that bench where you have the flexibility to do what you just described in your department. And so it's a downward spiral. And, and how many of us have used that sailor that's our go-to repairman, and you either got to pull him out of the rack, or he's working on something, and then you're going to go try to put him on watch two hours after he's been working 12 hours to fix your gear, and you can see the look on his face. He's mad as all get out because he knows you're not taking care of him. And that's that first line of bearing. It's about taking care of your people. So you take him off the watch bill. But, but you've got to have somebody else that's trained and qualified uh, to stand as watch for him. And so this, this all comes together if it's going to be effective. We've got a question here at the mic. Uh, Ted Kay, and I'm uh, going to ask the ops boss question for the, for the panel, which is the ops boss's job is to get the ship from A to B, meet the schedule of events, meet tasking, and in some cases try to get as much training in the meantime across all the different personalities and competencies, some of which are on the wrong watch bill and all that other stuff. So as you mentioned, the uh, first th thought that crossed my mind was, are the, uh, the task force commanders uh, wired into the uh, ability to manage the op tempo of the ships? Uh, in the days of the Soviet Union, you know, we practiced 2 a.m. unreps every three days. 
That's what we did. Uh, we did all sorts of things so we could just show we could do it in the odd hours. Um, so, and God knows we had to develop the competencies of many different people in different watch sections so you could achieve this. And in my opinion, the ships are all different levels of competencies across all the different warfare domains. And engineering is crying to get their, their uh, drills in. Flight ops guys are trying to get their stuff in on top of that because that's what the tasking is. Uh, if you're behind a carrier, you're attached to the carrier's ops. So it's, it's a complicated thing. So I'm, the question is, how do we plan and execute this? So, so yeah, as a two-time offender, as an ops officer, uh, <laughs> I will tell you that, uh, that that question really came up pretty quickly. And so one of the strategies that we used was TAOs had to manage the 24 hours and in, right? So the, the N33, if you will, they had to do current ops. So, so ops and the, the A ops, right, the uh, ops tech LDO, we split them apart on the watch bill so that there's always one who would not be, uh, you know, in the rack. Uh, uh, and allowed them to do kind of a little bit of the longer range planning. But TAOs just had to learn to manage when the battle watch captain chatted something over, they were going to flex with the OD to, to get the rudder over and to meet the immediate taskings. And so that took, that took a lot of learning, right, you know, for, for Chang and, uh, and Stowe and other folks who were sitting up at the front table to take that on board. But, but it really was the only way to work because you just can't keep calling ops every time the battle watch changes the plan because then there's absolutely no sleep. And so that was, that was a good way of doing that. And we, we tried to make the interface to the shore uh, commands or the fleet commands uh, just sort of invisible. Like they didn't, as long as they reached out to the ship, we internally were gonna fix that problem and not make it a, this is the one email address that you can get an answer from, uh, which was more of a challenge on the NATO side when we worked with the French for a month than it was working for uh, CTF 55 or 50, whoever we got bounced around to. Uh, and we worked for a lot of different commanders. So we tried to make that in invisible to the outside world, uh, and we used the TAOs to manage the 24 hour battle rhythm. Uh, one off the stage question there's always the turnover between one of the section and the other. And you spend a lot of time making sure your relief knows what's going on right now before that person gets to leave and, and shed the responsibility. Uh, how did you handle that? That's a lot of time. If you count up the hours, that might be a significant number of minutes and seconds. Hey, uh, matter of fact, uh, Joel, as the XO, as, as part of EWO ARG, uh, how about commenting on how you guys manage that? With the engineering watch bill especially, I, that's where I, my familiarity was, of course. Um, you know, we had our standard procedures for assuming the watch, watching a watch station and things of that nature. Uh, the person who was probably most impacted by that was the EAO. Um, EAOs were in a larger rotation than the rest of the watch sections. I just had more depth on the bench at that point. And we tried to keep it to where we used the five and dime kind of watch rotations, but I'd had enough EAOs to where I had five EAOs. I didn't rotate them. They would stay in the same watch cycle so they could get a, uh, a, a circadian rhythm going around that time frame. We weren't dogging the watch every week. It was usually, you know, until somebody complained about it and everyone liked the watch because they got to pick which one they had. Uh, so the pre-watch walk around was done prior to coming on watch. Um, usually, you know, half hour or so prior to, they would walk the other main space. They'd, you know, check on the, uh, the diesel spaces and, and so on and then come on, come down. 15 minutes before turnover time and start turn the turnover process. So for us, it was it was pretty simple to manage as far as the senior uh, watch station I had. Uh, with the other watch standers, you know, their their watch stations were a lot smaller, uh, a lot more easy to uh, walk and, and and do the turnover process. Um, and then at the same time, we had a space supervisor in each space who maintained um, oversight of the whole process as well. So, so if I could add two things to that. So good turnover logs, right, that, that I would read to, to bring up my own situational awareness, right, the OD turnover log, the TAO turnover log, I would read those to kind of see what was going on. on a, so that, that gives you a good history. Somebody comes on watch and they're seeing back to the last 
you know, 24 hours, but also keeping a, uh, a, a next 96 hour schedule that we updated frequently. I put copies of that in all the night orders so people could see what was coming up and help them prepare. So, you know, t looking back 24 hours, looking ahead 96 was key because turnovers were, were a problem. When you're, when you're conducting, you know, eight turnovers a day, right, that's eight opportunities to screw it up. So, um, you know, we, we put a lot of focus on trying to make sure, and I would spot check. I would come up and ask the questions, of course, knowing the answers to make sure that the turnovers were going well. Uh, and through, you know, through the SWO process of pain, uh, we, we got there. You, you know, your, uh, your question, I, I want to, uh, it's a good question. It, it made me think of, of something that I hadn't thought of before. Because you, you mentioned the strike group commander may force you to be doing something outside of your circadian rhythm. Uh, well, the strike group commander wants you to be in a circadian rhythm. And so what you're talking about is like a strike group circadian rhythm. And so within, you know, what we call the Bubba's process, so th these are your, this is your synchronization team that plans all the exercises and things that the, the strike group's going to be doing outside of real world. You, you can actually plan and take this into account. You can build these exercises and things that you're going to do inside uh, the planned circadian rhythm of the ships. I didn't do that when I was a strike group commander, I, I wasn't that good uh, to think of that, but I left it up to my commanding officers that within the plan, hey, they need to execute their own circadian rhythm. The other, the other piece too is, it, it goes back to this toughness uh, equation. The enemy gets a vote. So this is about uh, maintaining uh, circadian rhythm as much as you can so you have that margin. Somebody, you know, brought this point up. Uh, and, and that will give you that level of toughness and resiliency. Uh, and you're not being broken down, you know, over a long period of time. So when it's time for battle, when, when it's time to everybody get up and go to general quarters, you're ready to go. Uh, your body's in tune, you've got that margin, and you're not broken down. But if you don't get into this, you don't have that margin to fight. But you had a follow-on. And it's directed to you, Avril. The, <laughs> the, the folks that I'm listening to, some of whom I know, uh, are well-versed well in trying to get their crew to that state where they can get to their circadian rhythm comfortably. Sounds to me like it's a getting ready for deployment process where you're training everybody and you're getting everybody competent in all their uh, particular jobs so that you can execute the circadian rhythm properly, which sort of ends at the last vestige of your training evaluation where you're, okay, we're, it's not an option anymore, you need to be circadian, so tell me how you're gonna do it with the levels of competence and the professionalism that the crew can display. How, how, how do you assess that they're ready to go? Yeah, so very good point. So uh, in the basic phase of training, uh, you know, crawl, walk, run, uh, before you can get in a circadian, let, let me make sure that you know what you're doing first. So that's what we focus on. And, and once we get to the competence piece, and now we go out and, and we're doing group sales, and I've got the force together, and now we can start uh, taking a look at Okay, each individual ship is competent. Let them get in their circadian rhythm. And now, as a force, let's do group sail. Let's let the force get into a group sail construct where everybody's doing the circadian rhythm. This is where I can start getting at, you know, that strike group circadian battle rhythm as well. And then, of course, now we have the SWAT. So now I'm, I'm training you to be operate at the high-end fight. Well, while I'm assessing your ability to fight at the high-end fight, I need to be a, a, assessing how you're doing this in a circadian rhythm. So that's something that we need to incorporate into our advanced phase and integrated phase of training to make sure that you can do that. But, uh, however, comma, I'm going to throw you out of that circadian rhythm, uh, and I'm going to drive you to where you're tired, uh, where you're upset, uh, and, and I'm going to determine a level of toughness that you're going to need to fight at the high end. I'm, I'm going to take you out of that comfort of, of getting seven hours of sleep because that's what it's going to look like in real life. But you'll have the margin if you're doing this other stuff right. Okay. 
Thank you. Next question. Good evening, Admiral. Good evening, Admiral, and to the entire panel. Uh, I must begin with a brief confession. Uh, as a two-time someone that served as an XO from two separate billets, I, I feel like so I need to flog myself for being the one responsible for all those late-night uh, intel briefs and uh, PODs. Uh, but uh, all, in all sincerity, my question is this, Admiral, and to the entire panel. Um, as someone that now teaches uh, uh, the future generation of SWOs at the NROTC program in Texas, what should I go back to my unit in particular, and perhaps even to across the entire NRC d domain, to tell the future generation of surface warfare officers uh, to expect? When they get to the fleet, should they expect that they will walk into ward rooms that have fully embraced the notion of Arcadian rhythms, or should they expect that this will be, uh, uh, it'll vary from, uh, from ward room to ward room? Thank you, sir. No, th this is mandated that you do this. Uh, now, the reason why the commanding officer gets paid the medium bucks, th they have to evaluate in their particular circumstance, can they do this, all right? You, ships are at varying degrees of number of people are qualified, uh, levels of manning, uh, material condition, all these factors play a role in how well you can execute the circadian rhythm. Chuck. Yes, sir. So I want to, uh, I want to talk not to the what, what do you expect when you walk into a wardroom, but I want to go back to that. What can you tell these young midshipmen? And I think one of the big things is you look at culturally, American culture, world culture in general over the last 30 years, we've become a lot more aware of nutrition, exercise, personal fitness, that's, that's kind of become ingrained in our culture. Sleep hygiene, which is, is sort of the sleep and rest component of that, has not. You know, not only do we tend to culturally disregard it as swoes, but our culture in general, hey, I did an all-nighter playing Xbox, hey, you know, I'm on my phone at all hours. We have, we have become a culture that does not value sleep. So what you can, what you can train your midshipmen, regardless of whether they're gonna be a SWO or a Marine or an aviator or a submariner is, you need to take advantage of the opportunities that you are given to sleep, and it's gonna vary depending on operations, but you know, sleep periods aren't Xbox periods. You need to recharge, you need to press up your service tanks uh, to steal Dave's analogy. And they need to be taught to value that and not, ah, pff, you know, I'm gonna go you know, watch a roll them, you know. Teach them how to nap effectively. In all seriousness, right? I mean, yeah. nap is the secret tool, uh, whether that's a 15-minute power nap, right, or whether that's I've got my two hours to reset. You know, the ability to sleep on demand uh, is a quality that should be uh, embraced. And, and the other thing I would say is uh, the, the uh, energy drinks. Get them off those energy drinks because, you know, if you've got high levels of caffeine, it's going to be very hard for you to nap. So and you've got five to ten hour half life of caffeine. So, so you know they're going to be carrying that energy uh, drink around with them for quite a while. So. Thank you, thank you, mm -hmm. panelists. Thank you. Okay, getting our sailors off the mud. That that was actually going to be the last question. I, I just got the word on that. I'll, I'll do some a finishing comment here. Uh, getting our sailors off the monster and the Red Bull. That's going to be our re our real challenge. Uh, based on that, uh, let me close this out by saying a couple of things. Uh, you've heard it said before a lot of times, uh, you know, everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten or I learned in elementary school. And we, and we talked about uh, our teachers telling us, you know, uh, well rested is well tested. Uh, but we didn't understand that they were talking about this. And so a, a culture of compliance is that you have studied for the exam and you are ready to pass the exam. That's a culture of compliance. Uh, the culture of excellence is that you have studied for the exam and you're well rested now to take the exam with the knowledge that you have. That's what this is about. That's, that's how we press to the high end fight. It's also been said, I read somewhere, that the blind can't lead the blind, all right? And so, a well-rested blind man still can't lead another blind man. So at the end of the day, this is about competence. You have to be competent. That's the entering argument to the circadian rhythm. If you're not competent and your ship can't operate, you can get all the rest you want. Uh, it's not going to help you. 
And so the CO SWAS is making sure that we have comparable uh, and competent uh, mariners that go out there and we're doing the same thing uh, through our training. So with that, thank you for your questions and thank the panel. All right. Okay. Beer 30. Get your rest. Thank you so much.